Good morning, good morning. Time for convening has arrived. The Senate will come to order. At this time, I'll ask all unauthorized personnel to exit the chamber. Chair recognizes a senator from the 28th, a good man from Coweta County. Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning. I want to wish you a happy National Milk Day today. And good news for everyone. We've got a couple of pages, so you're not going to have to hear my reading. I want to introduce a brother and sister, Jack and Julia Grace Benton. And they come all the way from Savannah, Georgia. So y'all give the Bentons a big hand. Jack, Julia, Grace, we look forward to working with you guys today. Y'all get out there and get to work. Mr. President, the journal has been read and found to be correct. All right. Thank you, Senator, and thank you uh, to those pages back there. We appreciate, appreciate them being here with us. Is there objection dispensing of the reading of the journal? Chair hears none. The reading of the journal is dispensed with. Is there objection to the confirmation of the journal? Chair is none, the journal is confirmed. All senators who have bills and resolutions to introduce, please bring them to the secretary's desk. First reading and references to Senate bills and resolutions. Se secretary? Senate Bill 344 by Senator Anna Vitarte of the 31st and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend code section 4883 of the OCGA relating to exemptions from sales and use taxes so as to exempt sales of firearms. Finance. Senate Bill 345 by Senator Walker of the 20th, a bill to be entitled an act to authorize the assessment and collection of technology fees. State and local government. Senate Bill 346 by Senator Anna Vitarte of the 31st and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Part 1 of Article 3 of Chapter 5 of Title 50 of the OCGA relating to government general. oversight. Senate Bill 347 by Senator Anna Vitarte of the 31st, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Code Section 1516. Judiciary. Senate Bill 348 by Senator Williams of the 25th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Code Section 451624 of the OCGA. Health and Human Services. Senate Bill 349 by Senator Huff Settler of the 52nd and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 5 of Title 48 of the OCGA relating to ad valorem tax. Finance. Senate Bill 350 by Senator Kubrick of the 32nd and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Title 16 of the OCGA relating to offenses against public health and morals so as to prohibit the sale of consumable. Judiciary. Senate Bill 351 by Senator Anna Vitarte of the 31st and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Titles 20 and 39 of the OCGA relating to education and minors respectively, so as to provide for social media platform access by minors and require... Education and youth. That completes the order, Mr. President. Secretary, read the report on Sandy Committees. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Health and Human Services has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation, that House Bill 571 do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator Watson of the 1st District Chairman. It is Mr. now time. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on State and Local Governmental Operations has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation that Senate Bill 333 do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator Ginn of the 47th District Chairman. That completes the order, Mr. President. It is now time for the morning roll call. Are there any motions to excuse? Senator from the 33rd. Senator from the 33rd. Thank you, Mr. President, I ask for unanimous, and good morning, y'all. I'd like to ask for unanimous <laughs> consent to excuse the Senator from the 42nd and the 38th for business outside, and the 39th for business outside the Capitol. Without objection, senators from the 42nd, 38th, and 39th are excused. Recognize the senator from the 8th. Mr. President, I ask for unanimous consent to excuse the senator for, from the 11th for business outside the Capitol. Without objection, the senator from the 11th is excused. Recognize the senator from the 2nd. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I ask for unanimous consent to excuse the Senator from the 15th for business inside the Capitol. Without objection, the Senator from the 15th is excused. Are there any other motions? All right. Without objection, the Secretary will call the roll of Senators. Please signify your presence by voting the yay switch. The Secretary will unlock the machines. Senator from 29th, for what purpose do you rise? Mr. President, I rise to ask for unanimous consent to excuse the Senator from the 50th for business inside the Capitol. It is, uh, it's too late. The, the roll call has already started there, Senator, but. So when he comes back, he won't be mad. It is now time for the morning devotion. All senators, please take your seats and cease all conversation. I would ask the doorkeepers secure the chamber at this time. Uh, I just also want to remind everyone that we're going to be on a, a tight schedule because of the state of the state. Uh, and uh, so be mindful of that. And because uh, we'll proceed over to the house chamber right at 11 o'clock. So um, those of you who want uh, who are going to attend the state of the state um just know that uh it's we we're, we're going to be tight on schedule so po points of personal privilege and all those kind of things just uh keep them to a minimum but it's now uh my honor to call on the minority leader today uh she, she and her special guests and i will i'll call on the minority leader for the pledge and uh introduction of the pastor Will you do the pledge with me? Good morning. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Good morning, everyone. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing someone that came highly recommended to me. He is Pastor Kevin T. Moore. He is the pastor of St. Phillips in Stone Mountain. St. Paul, I'm sorry. I always get St. Paul and St. Philip mixed up. But he's in uh, Stone Mountain. As a matter of fact, I'm a member of the AARP, and that's where we have our meetings, in their great big room with food and information and fellowship, friendship, all of that included. Pastor Moore is best known as a pastor, preacher, and motivational speaker. So don't be surprised if you get a little carried away up here this morning. To prepare himself for pastoral duties, Pastor Moore ensured that he attained the kind of education needed to guide him on his pastoral path. A graduate of Morris Mount College with a Bachelor of Science degree in organizational management and leadership. Our speaker also completed a three-year Master of Divinity, a degree program in two years at the Inter 
Denominational Theology Center in Atlanta and with honors. He has completed his doctoral program in ministry and as a part of his program of study, he completed a required study tour in Brazil at the University of Methosta in Sao Paulo. He also has five units of clinical pastoral education. Pastor Moore, as a preacher, comes from a long line of pastors. He is a third generation pastor who believes that the word of God has life-changing power. Ordained as an interim elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Church in 2011, Pastor Moore worked in the vineyard as a co connectional evaluation chair and connectional worship leader for the Young People's Department of the AME Church, and he served as an Ella Baker trainer for the Children's Defense Fund and the Black Community Crusade for Children, working very closely with Marion Wright Elderman. Pastor Moore currently serves on the Board of Trustees for Turner Theological Seminary. He currently serves as the senior pastor of St. Paul AME Worship Center. Oh, it's in Lithonia, not Stone Mountain. I tried to claim it. And serves as the chairman and CEO of Bethel Housing Community Development, Inc. in Albany, Georgia. Please welcome Pastor Kevin T. Moore. First, I'd like to thank Senator Gloria Butler for her unwavering commitment to our community. I would also like to thank her for this amazing opportunity to serve for the first time as the chaplain of the day for the Georgia Senate. In addition, I'd like to acknowledge Bishop Reginald T. Jackson, the 132nd elected and consecrated bishop of the AME Church, and the members of the AME Church who are praying for me in this very moment. I am also grateful for my cousin, Steve Skelton, who is here, Pali Bordadoku, and my niece, Lauren Moore, and to Beatrice Williams, who is a longtime family friend. Dear honorable members of the Georgia Senate, as we gather in this esteemed chamber, we find ourselves in this blessed season of epiphany, a time that reminds us of revelation, of new beginnings, and of the light that guides us through our darkest hours. This season, emblematic of insight and discovery, beckons us to reflect on the profound virtue of unity, a principle that is more than just a call for harmony, it is the bedrock upon which this great state stands. In Georgia, our diversity is our strength. From the Blue Ridge Mountains to the cobblestone streets of Savannah, from the bustling cityscape of Atlanta to the serene plains of the rural South. We are a tapestry of varied threads, each unique, each vital. Like the star of epiphany that led wise men from different lands to a common purpose. Let this season inspire us to seek out our common goals, to respect our differences, and to work together for the welfare of every Georgian. Unity does not mean uniformity. It means coming together with our different views, backgrounds, and beliefs, and finding the collective wisdom in our diversity. It's in the respectful exchange of ideas, in the compassionate listening to each other's stories, and in the shared commitment to the common good that our true virtue is forged. As we embark on this legislative session, let us be guided by the spirit of epiphany. Let us open our hearts and minds to the possibilities that unity brings. And may our discussions be enlightened, our decisions be wise, and our actions be for the benefit of all who call Georgia home. In this season of revelation, let us commit to being beacons of hope, unity, 
and understanding. Together, let us build a Georgia that shines brightly, a state that stands as a testament to what can be achieved when we join hands and hearts in the pursuit of the greater good. Thank you for your dedication to our state and its people. May this season be productive and may it reflect the spirit of unity that embodies the best of who we are as Georgians. And as I close this devotion, I would like to leave you with this prayer that I learned while serving as a hospital chaplain at St. Francis Hospital in Columbus, Georgia by St. Francis of Assisi. Let us pray. Lord, make us an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console to understand as to, as to, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying the, that we are born to eternal life. Amen.
Yeah. If I could have everyone's attention, please. This is going to be really our last uh, line of business here before we're going to probably stand in recess to get ready to walk over. But we did not want to miss out on the opportunity to introduce and showcase a, a doctor we have here today because uh, we always appre appreciate our physicians who come down here and volunteer their time. And I will call on my good friend from the Senator of the 14th to, to introduce our doc of the day. Thank you, Mr. President. It is a true honor to stand up here today and introduce a doctor who has now arrived in my district not too long ago. Her name is Dr. Letitia Bilbrew, and she has quite an amazing story. She's an orthopedic surgeon who specializes in hand and upper extremity surgery, and she is the first black woman orthopedic surgeon to become a partner at Resurgence Orthopedics in Atlanta. Uh, the doctor was born in Birmingham, England, as were her parents. Her grandparents were farmers in Jamaica, migrated to England shortly after World War II, only one generation removed from farming in the mountains of Trelawney and cleaning hospital bedlands in England, Dr. Bilbrew became the first physician in her family. Her motivating catalyst for becoming a physician was watching the mistreatment of her grandmother in an English hospital. Though her first observation had to do with racial disparities within a healthcare system, she was determined to be the antithesis of the physicians that she had observed. In 1995, she migrated to the United States with her family to begin her journey to becoming a doctor. She earned her undergraduate degree in neuroscience and chemistry at the University of Miami in Miami, Florida, where I understand that she knew and was friends with the senator from the 6th, uh, and her medical degree from the Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. She completed her orthopedic residency at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas, and completed her fellowship at U of F College of Medicine, Department of Orthopedics and Rehabilitation. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and skip to this part because I know we're pressed for time. Her offices are in De Decatur and Snellville. I wanna say this twice. She is one of fewer than five practicing African-American female surgeons in the state of Georgia. And I think while today we recognize that incredible accomplishment, we are also mindful of what the governor said yesterday at Eggs and Issues and what he will likely say again today in just a few minutes, which is that we face such a critical shortage of healthcare professionals in this state, and Dr. Bilbrew's service is admirable and an example of the type of frontier that we need to move beyond. Um, let me skip to the very end here. Each fall and winter, she raises school supplies for DeKalb County school systems as well as a toy drive in conjunction with Marines Toys for Tots. Her overall goal is to ensure that the next generation of minority orthopedic surgeons surpass her and continues to build and grow for generations to come. I did not read all her accolades, uh, but she obviously, uh, it's an honor to have her here today. Please help me welcome Dr. Bilbrew. Thank you, thank you everyone. Like you said, my name is Dr. Letitia Bilbrew. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, specialized in hand and upper extremity surgery. That being said, it has been several years since I have treated a heart attack or stroke, so this is gonna be a healthy day for everyone, hopefully. Otherwise, Nurse Julia is gonna be doing most of the hard work. Um, we have a saying in surgery. It says to measure twice and to cut once. And what that um, determines is the discipline, the preparedness, the execution, that is needed to carry out surgery. So on behalf of the Medical Association of Georgia, on behalf of myself, on behalf of my patients and your constituents, thank you for always measuring twice and cutting once. Thank you for the preparation that you do, for the discipline, for your time and your efforts in ensuring that Georgia has one of the best healthcare systems in the United States. Thank you for having me.
I recognize the majority leader for a motion. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate stand in recess for the purpose of convening a joint session to hear an address from the governor and upon dissolution of the joint session that the Senate stand adjourned until 9 a.m. Friday, January the 12th. The majority leader has moved. Mr. Secretary, you have announcements? The Joint Economic Development and Tourism Committee will meet at 1 p.m. at the Georgia World Congress Center in Hall C in Atlanta, Georgia. The Regulated Industries and Utilities Committee will meet today at 2 p.m. in room 450. The Public Safety Committee will meet at 3 p.m. in room 450. And the rest of the committee meetings have been canceled for today. That completes the order, Mr. President. Recognize the Senator from the 19th, our Appropriations Chair. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members, you know after the Governor's State of the State of Speech, you'll have the release of the Governor's budget proposals. Your big books where you can get a copy of the amended and uh, FY25 budget proposals will be available at 12 noon, starting at 12 noon in the Senate Budget and Evaluation Office across in the CLOB. Once you go through the security station, you turn to the right. Remember, only you or someone you designate can pick up that book. They will have to sign out for you. Uh, we just have a limited cut number of copies, so only one for each senator. So thank you, Mr. President. Uh, see you guys afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The majority leader has moved that the Senate stand in recess for the purpose of convening a joint session to hear an address from our governor. And upon that adjourning that joint session, the Senate will stand adjourned until 9 a.m. Friday, 9, 9 a.m. Friday, tomorrow morning, January 12, 2024. All those in favor of the motion will say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. Ayes clearly have it.
House will come back to order. House will come to order. Members, you know the drill. Take your seats, please. Members will please take their seats. Members will please take your seats. Members will please take your seats. Mr. Doorkeeper. Mr. Speaker, the President, the President Pro Tem, and the members of the Senate await entrance to the House Chambers. Mr. Doorkeeper, please allow the President, the President Pro Tem, and the members of the Senate to enter the House Chamber. And will the messenger please escort them to their designated seats?
We're going to ask the Senate to take their seats. All members of the House and Senate will please take their seats. I know y'all haven't seen each other in a day or two. Mem members, I think y'all are getting ready for the next guest. But if members will take their seats or at least have your attention. Mr. Doorkeeper. Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Michael P. Boggs, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, the Honorable Nels S. D. Peterson, Presiding Justice of the Supreme Court, the Honorable Amanda H. Mercier, Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals, and the Justices and Judges of the Supreme Court and Court of Appeals, prospectively, await entrance to the House Chambers. We're, um, you have quite a list there, Mr. Doorkeeper. Mr. Doorkeeper, if you will please allow the Honorable Michael P. Boggs, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, the Honorable Nels S. D. Peterson, Presiding Justice of the Supreme Court, the Honorable Amanda H. Mercier, Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals, and the Justices and Judges of the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals, respectively, to enter the House Chamber, and will the messenger please escort them to their seats.
Mr. Doorkeeper. Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Brian P. Kemp, Governor of Georgia, his committee of escorts and distinguished guests await entrance to the House Chambers. Mr. Doorkeeper, please allow the Governor, his committee of escort, and distinguished guests access to the House Chamber. Yeah, we want to sit or stand. Members of the House and Senate, this joint session will come to order.
I'll ask everyone to take their seats. It's great to see a full house this morning. Good to have our friends from the Senate. Certainly good to have a full gallery this morning. So welcome everyone to the People's House. Mr. Clerk, will you read a resolution? House Resolution 763 by Representative Estration of the 104th, a resolution calling a joint session of the House of Representatives and the Senate for the purposes of hearing a message from the governor inviting the justices of the Supreme Court and the judges of the Court of Appeals to be present at joint session. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Well, we want to recognize a few people this morning and let everyone show their appreciation to the folks that are here. First, I'll ask you to stand when I recognize you as a group. The constitutional offices of the greatest state in the Union, the constitutional offices of Georgia, would you all please stand? I know you're in the gallery. Let's give them a great hand. Good looking group. Members of the Consular Corps, will you please stand so we can give you, show you our appreciation. Thank you all for being here. Now, a special person to the people of Georgia, and especially to this house, the Speaker Pro Tem of this house, Jan Jones. Thank you for your service. And a gentleman I've known for a few years, but uh, our paths have brought us closer together. And we're working well. We're, we're both pretty strong-willed. <laughs> but it all works out. So it's um, a real pleasure for me to introduce the President of the Senate, a dear friend, Bert Jones. Another dear friend, the President Pro Tem of the Senate, John F. Kennedy. Welcome, sir. Now, a special lady to me, one of the best mothers and grandmothers, and just generally help keep a guy straight. My wife, Dale Burns. <laughs> the Lieutenant Governor had given me a speech for about five minutes on this next one, but I'm, I'm going to shorten it down a little bit. A great First Lady of the Senate that we appreciate her. Appreciate her being here today, Jan Jones. If you will, welcome First Lady of the Senate, Jan Jones. Another First Lady. Let me tell you how incredibly proud I am and grateful to this lady for her work on human trafficking. We thank you, we appreciate you, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. So human trafficking no longer exists in our state. The first lady of the state of Georgia, Marty Kemp.
an incredible first family who's uh, stood by their mom and dad and continue to support them every day. So we appreciate these incredible daughters, Lucy Kemp, Amy Porter Kemp, and Jared Kemp. Let's welcome the Kemp ladies. Thank you for your service to Georgia. Lucy, we couldn't go on if you didn't stand up. You had to do it. <laughs> a special treat for us as well. She's been here any numbers of times, and we always appreciate her. The mother of the governor of this state of Georgia, Miss Ann Cavendish. Miss Ann, first mother, thank you for being here. Again, thank you all for being here. First family, we appreciate you and, and your support for our governor and for what you are doing for our state. So now comes the fun part for me, to recognize a friend and a man, a governor of this state, who's doing it all right. A leader that proved, proves himself every day. He was a leader before he came here and assumed the position of governor. His skill set has improved every day because he has worked every day to ensure that the people of Georgia are better than they were the day before. And I truly believe that his accomplishments working for the hard workers, hard working people of Georgia will go down in the history of this state. He has sustained our state through tough times and certainly through very good times as well with a rock solid, common sense approach to life and to government. He, does, he needs no introduction, obviously, in our state, but I can assure you that his leadership, he needs no introduction in many parts, in any part of this country and in many parts of the world. It's my great honor and my great pleasure to welcome my friend, the 83rd governor of the state of Georgia, Brian P. Kemp. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you all very much. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for those kind words. I appreciate the recognition. It's an honor to be here. Lieutenant Governor Jones, Speaker Burns, President Pro Tem Kennedy, Speaker Pro Tem Jones, members of the General Assembly, constitutional officers, members of the Public Service Commission, Mayor Dickens, members of the Judiciary, members of the Consular Corps, and my fellow Georgians. Later this year, the people of this state will once again fulfill their civic duty. They will choose who occupies these seats of service, and they will determine what course America takes in the years to come. As they have in years past, when they go to the ballot box, they'll see a stark difference between Georgia and our nation's capital. They'll see what we've achieved together at the state level to make Georgia an even greater place to live, work, and raise a family. And they'll see the hardships Washington, D.C. has brought into every home and placed on every kitchen table across our state. Congress has become synonymous with runaway spending, bloated budgets, job-killing regulations, gridlock and partisanship, and elected representatives in both parties who are more interested in getting famous on cable news than delivering results for the American people. All the while, across the nation, over 60% of households are living paycheck to paycheck. 
Over 8.4 million Americans are working two jobs to make ends meet. Mortgage rates remain at highs not seen in a generation. And while the rate of inflation may have fallen, high prices on everything from groceries to rent have not. In fact, it cost Americans over $11,000 more per year to maintain the same quality of life that they had just a few short years ago. For the hardworking men and women of this country, paying $11,000 more a year is not a choice between the luxuries of life. For too many people, that's a decision between putting food on the table for their family, making their car payment, buying clothes for their kids, or going further into debt. For a recent graduate, it's about whether you can afford to get your own place and pay off your student loans. For a single mom, it's a decision about taking a job, a new job and a new career that pays better, but it doesn't offer child care. For a family of four, can they make ends meet when also saving for their kids' college and trying to pay their mortgage? And for our seniors, are they able to stretch a fixed income to meet their basic needs? These are the people that Washington, D.C. has left behind. Because for every challenge our nation faces, the federal response is to spend more, regulate more, tax more, and come up with another government program meant to cure every ill. Instead of empowering hardworking Americans to innovate, create, seek greater prosperity, their answer is simply more government. But the good news is here in Georgia, we have chosen a different path because we realize that the success of our state does not rely on the actions of government, but the prosperity of our people. Washington, D.C. forgot a long time ago that it's not the brilliance of politicians or the good intentions of a new program that make our nation great. It is the resolve, the ingenuity, and the character of the American people. Those were the hardworking Georgians we heard from on the campaign trail. As a family, we heard their stories, their struggles, and their hopes for a brighter future. And as you all know, that was truly a family affair. And I want to thank Marty, Jarrett, Lucy, and Amy Porter for being there every step of the way. Thank you all. And I also appreciate my mom, who y'all recognized earlier, my sister Julie Reef and her husband are here with us today, and we just uh, are honored by their presence. My commitment to the people of our state was very simple. I promised to put hard work in Georgians first, fund our priorities like education, public safety, and health care, but also keep government efficient, responsible, and accountable. The federal government may have abandoned those principles, but here in Georgia, thanks to the partnership between my administration and the General Assembly, we have delivered real results for the people of our state, ahead of schedule and under budget. Thanks to a strong economy and conservative fiscal management of state revenues, we've provided nearly $5 billion of direct relief to taxpayers in tax refunds, gas tax suspensions, homestead tax exemptions, and more. You all were a big part of that. Despite unprecedented challenges, we have maintained a AAA bond rating while celebrating the creation of more than 171,000 new jobs and roughly $74.5 billion of investment in every corner of the Peach State over the last five years. And unlike a lot of blue states, these are private sector jobs, not growing the ranks of government, and we are not done yet. Last month, I joined Lieutenant Governor Jones, Speaker Burns, and others to announce a plan to speed up implementation of the largest state tax cut in history, 
With your support, I look forward to signing legislation that decreases our state income tax to 5.39% starting this year. This matters. It matters because it represents savings of $3 billion for Georgia taxpayers over the next 10 years. Mr. Speaker, Lieutenant Governor, while President Biden hires tens of thousands of new IRS agents, my vote is we just keep cutting taxes here in Georgia. The path that Georgia has taken over the last five years has led to record job growth, historic investment in communities from Bainbridge to Blue Ridge, $5 billion of tax relief, and enough funds saved to operate state government for months in an emergency, not days. Georgia is succeeding because we have charted our own path, rejected the failed policies of Washington, D.C., and worked together to put our citizens first. But I believe the worst thing we could do is call it a day and coast through what is certain to be another contentious election year. We have accomplished so much over the last five years, despite unprecedented times and challenges because we haven't gotten distracted from doing the job that we were sent here to do. Like I mentioned four years ago in my second State of the State address, we stayed true to the example of Nehemiah, committed to our great work, and now we are seeing the results. It's no secret that Georgia is growing and is a top state for business for a record 10 years in a row. New jobs are headed our way almost on a daily basis. Existing businesses are looking to expand, and companies from all over the world look to the Peach State to locate their next headquarters. But with growth comes the need for more trained workers to fill these good-paying jobs in a rapidly changing labor environment. That's why I was proud to unveil the Georgia Match Program at last year's Workforce Summit, the largest direct college admissions program in the nation. Georgia Match is already doing an incredible job linking the upcoming generation with the schools that meet their needs. As of today, over 10,000 students have already met their match. And we'll keep working to reach every high school senior in Georgia so that they know there is a higher education path open to them right here in the Peach State, no matter their circumstances. Speaking of ed education, my amended 2024 budget and the fiscal year 2025 budget proposals double down on our continued and historic support of K-12 education, with $1.4 billion in additional funds allocated to make a total of $12.8 billion. Republicans and Democrats alike have supported this record investment in our students. And I want to take a moment and thank all of you for that strong bipartisan achievement. It's also important for us to remember that increased funding does not guarantee greater success. As a small business owner for almost 40 years now, I believe, like many of you, that competition and the free market drives innovation. At the end of the day, it, they result in a better product for the consumer. When it comes to education, the same principles hold true. 
Over the last few years, there has been a great deal of debate around different proposals to expand options for students and families when it comes to finding the education that best fits their individual needs. Many members in both chambers have worked hard on this important issue, and I want to thank and applaud them for their efforts. Some prefer the term school choice or educational freedom. Some call them vouchers. In my opinion, what each of these terms or slogans fails to mention is the child. At the end of the day, our first and foremost consideration should be the future of that student. Our job is not to decide for every family, but to support them in making the best choice for their child. This week, as we begin the second year of another biennial of the General Assembly, I believe that we have run out of next year's. I firmly believe we can take an all of the above approach to education, whether it's public, private, homeschooling, charter, or otherwise. It's time for all parties to get around the table and agree on the best path forward to provide our kids the best educational opportunities we can, because that is what we were elected to do. To that end, my office and I look forward to working with the members and the leadership of both chambers to get a bill passed and signed into law this session. Finally, our students and teachers deserve to have a safe learning environment, no matter their zip code. Since I took office, I've had the opportunity to hold more than 30 roundtable discussions with educators and superintendents from all over this state. We heard frequently that our schools were in need of additional resources to enhance security. That's why since 2019, we have provided more than $185 million to all of our schools to help secure the safety and well-being of our students and our teachers. This year, I'm proposing we continue those efforts by making school security funding permanent. In my budget proposal, I've included a request for $104 million that will go directly to school districts for school safety enhancements. Schools will determine how to best use this money, whether for personnel like school resource officers or for physical or technology improvements that make our places of learning more secure. This investment is more significant because it will enable schools and administrators to plan accordingly, knowing that this money is headed their way for this specific purpose. I hope to see strong bipartisan support for this budget item to keep our kids and our schools safe. Since being sworn in as your 83rd governor, the top priority of my administration has been ensuring the safety and security of our communities. There is no doubt that we have made great progress from the GBI's anti-gang task force and heat unit and the Department of Public Safety's crime suppression unit to the First Lady's Grace Commission and the Attorney General's Human Trafficking Prosecution Unit and the school security measures I just mentioned. We have not wavered in our commitment to strengthening public safety. But the state cannot do it alone. Thankfully, over the last two years, we have had strong partners at the local level who have worked alongside state law enforcement to make our capital city safer. Two of these gentlemen are here with us today, and I want to take a moment and thank Mayor Dickens and Chief Sherbaum for their partnership. We appreciate you all. While the mayor and I come from different political parties and don't agree on everything, we do agree on the importance of reducing crime and keeping our citizens safe. 
Bipartisan majorities of both chambers, the mayor and myself, all agree on the critical need for the completion of the Atlanta Public Safety Training Center. This facility... This facility will provide our law enforcement officers, firefighters, and additional first responders the critical tools and knowledge, as well as the skills needed to keep themselves and our community safe. One of our brave public safety officers is here with us this morning. Exactly a year ago this week, this dedicated trooper was shot and severely wounded near the site of the Future Training Center. He spent weeks in the hospital fighting for his life. He endured multiple surgeries and spent the better part of a year in recovery while his family stood strong beside him. Marty and I were honored to spend time with him while he was in the hospital, and I was honored when he gave me one of my, my most prized possessions, his SWAT challenge coin bearing his badge number. He had that coin on him when he was shot that horrible day, and it is a constant reminder for the price paid by men and women like him all over this state who keep our children, our homes, our businesses, and our streets safe. Trooper First Class Jerry Parrish, will you please stand with your wife, Kelly, and let us thank you for your great service. Thank you to the entire Parrish family for your service, your bravery, and the sacrifices you've made over the past year for us. We are also joined in the gallery by some brave men who rendered life-saving aid to Trooper Parrish on site and who helped get him to safety. They represent some of the very finest from both the Department of Public Safety We are so grateful for you all. I don't claim to speak for anyone else in this chamber today, but this decision is very simple for me and my family. As long as I'm your governor, there will be no gray area or political double talk. We will support our law enforcement officers. We will support our firefighters and our first responders in the Atlanta Public Safety Training Center needs to be built, period. Article 1, Section 1, Paragraph 2 of the Georgia Constitution states, Protection to person and property is the paramount duty of government and shall be impartial and complete. To, to, to fulfill that paramount duty, we must do more than show our support for law enforcement in words. We have to show it through action. That is why last year, thanks to the work of the General Assembly, I was proud to sign a budget that included a $6,000 pay raise for state law enforcement officers. 
That pay raise was a recognition of the contributions these brave, these brave men and women make as they put their lives on the line day in and day out. This year, I look forward to working with each of you to once again provide another pay raise for state law enforcement. Within my budget proposal are pay increases of an additional $3,000 for state patrol officers like Troop Repairs, as well as our correctional officers and other state law enforcement agencies. These investments will not only serve as a renewal, renewal of our commitment to these law enforcement officers, but will also support our ongoing retention and recruitment efforts. I'm also urging the General Assembly to complete what we started last year and give final passage to the Peace Officer Loan Repayment Program. Because despite what some may say, we need more police officers, not fewer. This year, we'll also be continuing our efforts to combat human trafficking in our state, thanks to the leadership of the greatest First Lady in the country, Marty Kemp. <laughs> thanks to her work and that of the Grace Commission and members of both chambers, Georgia has gone from being known as a human trafficking destination to being known as the leader in going after traffickers and supporting the victims. Under the First Lady's leadership and with overwhelming support from both chambers, we have passed and signed into law eight pieces of legislation that go after those who work in this evil enterprise while also supporting the victims. Our efforts have, ena have enabled the GBI's heat unit to investigate 369 cases of human trafficking since its creation and for Attorney General Carr's Human Trafficking Prosecution Unit to secure 32 convictions while assisting rescue of over 129 victims since it launched. But we, st <laughs> but we still have work to do. And Marty and I are both looking forward to working with each of you this session to keep up that fight. Five years into my administration, when it comes to health care, we've made enormous strides in lowering costs, expanding access, and incentivizing more health care providers to give care. We began this work with the passage of the Patients First Act in 2019, and since then we've seen strong results. In 2019, no counties in Georgia had more than two health insurance carriers. Today, 87% of Georgia counties have three or more carriers. And thanks to Georgia Access and the Reinsurance Program, enrollment in the private sector exchange over the past five years has grown from just under 460,000 to over 1.2 million Georgians. Georgia Access is also saving hardworking families more and more in their wallets. In all, we've reduced premiums by an average of 11% across the state. That represents an average annual premium reduction of almost $929 million a year. In rural counties, where premium prices were the least affordable when I took office, Georgia Access has reduced premium pay payments, premiums by an average of 29%. And while some in the media refuse to acknowledge this, this significant progress, we will continue to support policies that work for Georgians, not political narratives. Because the fact is that for individuals and families struggling to make ends meet, lower insurance costs and more choices lead to better care that they can actually afford. And because... And because we've made those sound policy choices and budgeted conservatively, prioritized innovation and efficiency, 
We're now able to make other important investments in the health and well-being of hardworking Georgians. That includes our efforts in mental health. Two years ago, as you know, I was proud to sign into law the Mental Health Parity Act, a fitting capstone to the late Speaker David Ralston's years of service in this chamber and one that leaves a lasting legacy. One of the most visible examples of that legacy was the 988 crisis hotline campaign conducted by the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities last year. Thanks to Commissioner Kevin Tanner and his team, more Georgians than ever before are accessing services that help them when they need to turn their lives around for better. To enhance this program further, my budget proposal calls for an increase of $205 million for DBHDD and other entities that address mental health. This new funding will enable DBHDD to expand services for those struggling with mental illness. It will increase the number of crisis beds throughout the state. It will further crisis intervention resources in all communities and improve the quality of mental health services overall. Once passed, we will be spending $1.6 billion on mental health more than ever before. I'm proud of what these and other agencies are doing to help their fellow Georgians and keeping us the best state to live, work, and raise a family. As we speak all across Georgia, there are men and women working hard to keep our neighborhoods safe, attract new jobs and industries to communities in need, and teaching a whole generation that will un one day occupy these roles and much more. They have remained committed and hardworking during unprecedented challenges over the last five years, and I'm so proud of everything they have accomplished for our citizens. It is no secret that most state government jobs pay less than private sector opportunities in the same line of work. But for many of our employees do it because they feel a sense of public service, and they want our state to succeed. But for state government to stay efficient, and stay ahead of Georgia's continued growth, we must be able to attract and then retain employees who perform these vitally important jobs. That is why my budget proposal provides a pay increase for all state employees, including our teachers. <laughs> This will build on the historic raises we've provided for educators over, re over recent years and will increase every state worker's pay by 4%. My proposal also rewards those who gave decades of their lives and careers to serving others by allocating $500 million to shore up our state retiree fund, ensuring our state This, is, this will ensure that our state keeps its promises for our retirees and also stays on solid financial footing. Instead of expanding the size and scope of government, we're putting state dollars to work in targeted, efficient ways to recruit, retain, and thank employees in vital, vital roles from corrections officers to case workers. By doing so, we're continuing our efforts to wisely use every penny taxpayers send us from state agency personnel to our schools, public safety, and the healthcare marketplace. As we look across America, there is no doubt that we're at a crossroads. From crushing inflation and dysfunction in Washington to the crisis at our southern border and unrest overseas, these are indeed trying times. But I believe we have an opportunity here in Georgia, an opportunity to highlight a different path. 
One of the brilliant principles of America's founding is the role of the states. For them to be the laboratories of democracy, to protect the liberties and freedoms of their citizens, and to carry out the will of the people. Our founders didn't believe the state should always look to the federal government for answers. And by judging by current comparison, I don't think we would have much to learn. In Georgia, in Georgia, we balance our budget and spend less than we take in. We cut taxes instead of raising them. We return money back to the taxpayers rather than justifying new government programs. We back the blue and crack down on violent crime and gangs and put the safety of our communities ahead of partisan political agendas. We celebrate the free market instead of using the heavy hand of government. We work together across party lines on more issues than not. And most importantly, we put our people first. In an election year, I don't expect all of us to agree on every issue. Every district represented under this gold dome is different and sends each of you here with a unique set of issues to address. Over the next 36 legislative days, there will be passionate debate, there will be disagreements, there will be tough votes, there will be long nights, and maybe even some short tempers. But in the middle of all of that, I ask that we also remember Georgia is different for a reason, that our success is not an accident, but the result of a resilient people who elected their leaders to keep state government efficient, responsible, and accountable. In Georgia, we believe the American dream will always provide our people greater prosperity than the government. The state of our state is strong, growing, and full of opportunity. Let's use this session to keep it that way. Thank you all. May God bless you, and may God continue to bless the great state of Georgia. Thank you, Governor Kemp. I expected no less. That was awesome. Thank you for those words. Will the committee of escort please escort the Honorable Brian P. Kemp, Governor of Georgia, and his distinguished guest from the House Chamber.
The majority leader of this House, Leader Estration, is recognized for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that this joint session be dissolved. Is there any objection? Hearing none, this joint session is hereby dissolved. The House will stand in recess for about 10 minutes, and we'll get back to our business. Thank you all for being here. We're glad to have our guests in the chamber.